Happy Friday, everybody. James Hancock here. I'm back to review the new Hellraiser film, which dropped today on Hulu. And I'll be avoiding spoilers initially, but I'll get into some details later in my video. But I'll start with just the broad strokes. But this remake or rehash or rethinking, whatever you want to call it, it's um, basically a lot of ingredients from Hellraiser 1 and some ingredients from Hellraiser 2. They kind of stir them all together and try to make it feel fresh and new again. But it's directed by David Bruckner and written by Ben Collins, Luke Piotrowski, David S. Goyer, and it stars Jamie Clayton in the iconic role of Pinhead. So let's just start with her performance. I thought she was the best part of the movie. I thought she had a cool tone of voice. She had great poise. She really seemed to throw herself into the part. And in terms of special effects from the neck up, I thought she looked pretty damn cool. And I would come back and watch more Hellraiser movies in which she might appear. But if Hulu is taking requests, I would ask for a different creative team. Because when it comes to the writing and the direction, I thought this movie was just fair or average, or if you wanted to be even harsher, kind of bland and sanitary in a lot of ways, and it was missing a lot of the ingredients that I would like to see in a Hellraiser film. And to be fair, almost none of the Hellraiser movies out there, and I've seen most of them, uh, first and second one many times over, it's also third a few times over, but m even the Hellraiser movies sometimes struggle to get these ingredients right. I mean, for my part, really, it's the first movie and half of the second movie, as well as the source material, The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker, that really gets to the essence of what I want from a Hellraiser story. Because I think the first chapter of The Hellbound Heart is one of the greatest chapters in the history of horror fiction. I've read it many times, and it just floors me each time. And there's something just incredibly seductive and fascinating about a character who is a complete and total hedonist, he's a complete and total piece of shit, who is seeking pleasure. Like, the world has run out of surprises for him, but he feels like there are oceans of pleasure to be found if he can just, if he can just take this one last step and meet these otherworldly creatures who have hidden secret knowledge that he does not possess. And what's missing in this new movie it's this idea of them giving you the opportunity to sign up for the pain and torment that they're going to inflict. This movie almost goes so far as to make the critical mistake of turning the Cenobites into regular routine slasher movie monsters like Jason or Michael Myers or Freddy Krueger where they just kind of walk after you as you run just trying to stay away from them. And I feel like your interaction with the Cenobite should never be about accidentally being kind of plucked by the box and bleeding, and then they show up and they take you away. They should give you the opportunity to sign up, to opt in, and then give you the opportunity to regret your decision. And that's what makes that first chapter in Hellbound Heart so fascinating. And if you'll forgive me, I just want to read one or two quick sections from it. And if you've never read it nor listened to it, I strongly recommend you hunt down the audio fiction where Clive Barker reads it himself. But here's an interesting bit from when Frank first meets the Cenobites in the Hellbound Heart. And it reads as such, and yet he had expected something different, expected some sign of the numberless splendors they had access to. He had thought they would come with women at least, oiled women, milked women, women shaved and muscled for the act of love, their lips perfumed, their thighs trembling to spread, their buttocks weighty the way he liked them. Now let me just pause for a second. That is some really sexual stuff and... This movie is totally lacking in that kind of forbidden, taboo sexuality that the first movie totally embraced. And admittedly, I saw the first movie when I was like 11 or 12, so that was my first encounter with s and but it was also my first encounter with a horror movie where I was basically always kind of like looking around the corner to make sure that my parents weren't coming to see what filthy shit that I was watching in my spare time. And I was so young and so innocent and so inexperienced it couldn't even I couldn't even really articulate or process the sexual side of Hellraiser and basically what sadomasochism is all about. But I feel like if you don't have characters that are actively seeking pleasure through the Cenobites, then you're missing a key ingredient of what this franchise is all about. And then getting back to that first chapter in The Hellbound Heart, there's a fascinating exchange between Frank and these creatures as he's trying to understand what they might have to offer. And he says... I'd expected, Frank began, 
We know what you expected, the Cenobite replied. We understand to its breadth and depth the nature of your frenzy. It is utterly familiar to us. Frank grunted. So, he said, you know what I've dreamed about. You can supply the pleasure. The thing's face broke open, its lips curling back, a baboon's smile. Not as you understand it, came the reply. Frank made to interrupt, but the creature raised a silencing hand. There are conditions of the nerve endings, it said, the like of which your imagination, however fevered, could not hope to evoke. Once again... The the Cenobites need to seduce their victims. They don't just show up and kill people or torture people. There needs to be a forbidden quality to the horror. And then finally, once they've seduced or tricked or just persuaded people to subject themselves to the horrors that they inflict upon people, that's when the horror should really come crashing home. And the chapter concludes with this horrifying realization by Frank that he's made a terrible mistake where it reads... There was no pleasure in the air, or at least not as humankind understood it. He had made a mistake opening Lemarchand's box. A very terrible mistake. Oh, so you finished dreaming, said the Cenobite, perusing him as he lay panting on the bare boards. Good. She stood up. The tongues fell to the floor like a rain of slugs. Now we can begin, she said. And so we have a fascinating situation where this kind of horrible, depraved person is tortured and mutilated and then slowly but surely trying to fight his way back into reality. And that's where we get the plot of the original Hellraiser. And I I don't know how many times I've seen that movie, but I've been watching it for decades at this point. And there are some parts where it's a little bit, I guess, clumsy or uh, almost kind of amateur in its execution due to Clive Barker being a first-time director and also the limited budget. But there's something about that limited budget that really works to the film's advantage and the film's overall aesthetic where Hellraiser should feel dirty, it should feel grimy, it should feel a little sleazy. And this new movie has none of those qualities. Too often it just feels clean and digital and employs that kind of universal flat lighting that so many shows and movies use these days. It just felt like it could be any other horror movie, and that's probably in large part due to the pretty limp dialogue. I mean, most of the characters in this movie feel like they were plucked right out of any old teen slasher movie. And in the absence of great dialogue, they basically spend most of the movie just kind of cussing and screaming at each other. And it's really frustrating. I mean, when you're facing the Cenobites, you shouldn't have a bunch of teenagers screaming, fuck, fuck, shit, what do we do? That's slasher movie bullshit. And... More often than not, when all these characters were interacting with each other and trying to figure out what to do, it felt a little bit like film school dialogue, a very inexperienced dialogue written by inexperienced filmmakers where they're trying to use just pure emotion and intensity to make up for the fact that there's not a lot of creativity at play in the story. And where this movie really falls short is with the mystique of the Cenobites. Whereas in the first movie, all they have to do is just stand there and talk, and they're just fucking terrifying. They don't need to chase people. Basically, this movie makes the mistake that the third Hellraiser movie did, where they almost kind of become supervillains as opposed to a weird mix of like angels and demons. And just to give you a quick little uh, story from my misspent youth, Hellraiser 3 was shot in Greensboro, North Carolina, where I was living at the time of its release. And the night that we all went to see it was the first night that I experimented with LSD. And let's just say that I had many trials and tribulations and strange adventures getting to the movie. But the theater was packed with a lot of the kids who had been extras in the movie. And we were all just so fired up and so excited. But... There was a moment in Hellraiser 3 where a girl standing in front of this like obelisk where Pinhead is imprisoned and all these chains come out of his mouth and rip her skin off, almost like somebody ripping the skin off a chicken like in one fell swoop. And she's just standing there with no skin, shrieking and screaming. And we laughed so damn hard. I don't know if I've ever laughed that hard again. Like maybe I used up all my laughter for all time, but it was like one of the greatest moments of my life. We We could not believe what we were watching, but we just had so much goddamn fun. And I've revisited Hellraiser 3 a few times since then, and it's a it's a pretty bad movie in many ways, but at least it was kind of fun and exciting and sinful. And this new movie is lacking sin. It has a few little kind of like teenage makeout scenes, but they all feel very chaste and very wholesome. Just overall, this movie needed a sense of trying to lure the audience over to the dark side. I've never met anybody who has claimed that the original Hellraiser film kind of opened them up sexually, 
but it wouldn't surprise me if it has. Or movies like Videodrome, where some of the really strange, forbidden sexuality explored in that movie, it wouldn't surprise me to hear if Videodrome had opened up some people's ideas about pain and pleasure and that sort of thing. This movie just seems so cautious And what I really needed was just some outright scenes of abject terror, dread, suspense, horror, all those emotions, none of which I felt during this movie. Like when the Cenobites would show up, like, oh, cool, here here come the Cenobites. What are they going to do this time? But, like, think back to the first half of Hellraiser 2 when the person's dying on the mattress and the arms come up and grab him and the person's wrapped around basically sucking out his life essence. I mean, it is some ferocious, just atrocious, really gruesome horror. And like in the first movie, just a little thing, like when they're moving into the house and the dude gets his hand uh, caught on a nail on the wall when they're trying to drag that mattress up the stairs, it's just absolutely gut-churning in its intensity. And the first movie had so many cool little details, like the way the bells would chime when the Cenobites arrived and the lights would change. And it was so inexpensive, but so effective And they try to use the bells a few times in this, but not very well. But that sound is just so iconic. And instead, this movie does things like jump scares. And I'm sorry, the Cenobites should never be employed as a jump scare, where somebody turns around and thinks they saw them, and then turns around again, and they're gone. That's slasher movie bullshit. That is as generic and mainstream and lazy as horror gets. Once again, the Cenobites can just stand there without moving at all and be totally terrifying, or at least that's the kind of power they should exude. And if you can't pull off the horror, at least give us great characters. And not one of the central characters in this movie is interesting enough to sustain our emotional investment over the course of a two-hour movie. This movie did not need to be two hours at all. The first Hellraiser movie was barely over 90 minutes. I was feeling the runtime. This movie did not have two hours worth of story that it needed to tell. It definitely was dragging, had no sense of urgency or momentum toward the end. And looking back, I think there was only one moment in the movie where I was really impressed with the horror effects where one girl's getting a needle through the side of her neck and we see or we hear her screams from a POV from inside of her throat seeing the needle come through. And we needed like 20 more details like that because that is an example of the Cenobites teasing and manipulating your nerves in a way where it's incredibly visceral. We can feel the pain And I don't know why they didn't lean all the way in. Probably, once again, because this movie is a Hulu movie, and there's only so much uh, a movie's going to do when they're part of the overall Disney empire. And I think this movie really needed to go back to the drawing board and start over entirely with the design of the Cenobites. Pinhead, from the neck down, she just looked, I don't know, almost like like a costume you could buy off the rack in a drugstore. And... The flesh and the way that, basically the way the Cenobites like to torture and mutilate themselves, it it should be wet, it should be visceral, it should be practical, it shouldn't look like rubber or plastic. And then at the very end when we see a character being turned into a Cenobite, it just felt very digital. And there's something about digital which is very clean and sanitary and it keeps you at arm's length. Or as a good old-fashioned practical effect. feels like something you can touch. feels very tangible. And so I feel like this movie really ended on a... Not, not, it's not a bad movie. I mean, I'm making it sound like this horrible movie. It's just a resoundingly mediocre movie with one or two cool details. And if people really enjoy it, fantastic. I hope they continue to make Hellraiser movies moving forward. And I hope Jamie Clayton gets more work on this front. But I think it needs new writers. It definitely needs a new director. And the only other movie by this director that I've seen is The Ritual, which I remember enjoying well enough when it um, when it dropped on Netflix, but I've not yet seen The Night House. Apparently The Night House from 2020 is really goddamn good, but maybe, um, maybe David Bruckner is just not the horror maestro that Clive Barker is. And to be fair, very few are. Clive Barker's novel Damnation Game is one of my all-time favorite horror novels, And I feel like if you're going to look back at the 80s, which is a great era for best-selling horror fiction, like you walk into any grocery store or any drugstore during that time, and there were just like racks upon racks of all these crazy horror novels with all these lurid covers. Very fun time to be a young horror fan. But I didn't read Damnation Game until the early 2000s, and I was just floored by it. Ended up reading it a second time. 
So long story short, I'm just going to recommend that people read The Hellbound Heart, people read Damnation Game, or people just revisit the first two Hellraiser films. And I don't know if Hellraiser as a franchise will ever reclaim those heights, but it reached those heights at least once or twice, which is more than most horror movies can claim. But it's time for me to wrap up this video. I can tell that I'm rambling. I didn't sleep a whole hell of a lot last night. I stayed up late watching Lord of the Rings, finished my review around like 3 in the morning, started watching this, slept for a few hours, got up, finished it, did this video. And so I'm ready for a little uh, hey pal time. So hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you enjoyed my review. If so, please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. And if you want to talk more about the Hellraiser franchise or horror or Clive Barker, hunt me down on Twitter at Geeking Out. But I hope everyone has a great weekend. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.